It might be helpful to backtrack a little bit as to where we left off. It was in Gospel of John chapter 8. A lot of things were going on in this confrontation, the interaction that Jesus had with the religious leaders. We saw him proclaim that he is the light of the world and went on to talk about the truth. But now things get a little more penetrating into the hearts and the motives of the religious leaders. We're going to be looking at that in these coming verses. So we're going to back up a little bit to verse 36. This is Jesus speaking. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So we saw the last time that although the Pharisees were talking about being offsprings of Abraham, just purely a genetic thing, Jesus made it about spiritual connection. So Jesus was making the context of relationship, father, God is my father, and you have seen what you have heard from your father. He shifted from genetics to relationship. Now we pick it up in verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. So now they're picking up on what Jesus said, and they've shifted from the genetics of being the offspring of Abraham to now the relationship. Well, Abraham's our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. So he's just calling them out. I just want to briefly read from Hebrews. It summarizes what Abraham did. Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you didn't do what Abraham did. And it reads as such in Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. The Lord just told him, go. He didn't tell him where, just go. Wherever you are, you can't be here. It's got to be somewhere else other than here. And Abraham obeyed. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. So that summarizes what Jesus was referring to when he told the Pharisees, you didn't do what Abraham did, because Abraham responded in faith in God. He was obedient out of faith, not out of what made sense to him, but just what God told him. God said, go, he went. God said, sacrifice your son, and he attempted to until God told him, no. So that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, this is not what Abraham did. Verse 41, you are doing the works of your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God, which I find very interesting. Jesus called them out and said, you didn't do what Abraham did. And they didn't defend themselves. They didn't say, well, of course we did. What are you talking about? We didn't do what Abraham did. They deflected. We weren't born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. God's our father. They deflected because they couldn't defend what they did. So, oh, well, God's my father. And then here we go. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. I need to stop there. Makes it very clear. If God is your father, you would love me. Jesus makes it very clear. No one can truly love God the father unless they love God the son. Jesus didn't say, it's okay if you don't love me. There are many ways to the father. And if you want to worship this way and burn candles and do this, that's okay. He didn't say that. He made it very clear. If you claim to love the Father, you've got to love me. You've got to love me. So all of this ecumenical talk about how all of these other worldviews and other religions and cults, they all worship the same God, denies what Jesus himself said. You have to love the Son. Not a person's interpretation of who the Son is, but what God's Word says the Son is. There's no room for gray area here. It is that clear. So Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
That's a pretty strong statement. And we're going to break that down and examine each one of those elements because it's just packed. But then he goes on. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Pause a moment on that. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. You don't believe me because I'm telling you the truth. The reason you don't believe me is I'm being truthful. There is a determination to believe a lie rather than the truth. They're not rejecting and questioning whether he's truthful. They're just rejecting what he says. Verse 46, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Makes it clear. If I'm in sin, show me. Show me where I'm in sin. Show me where I'm in error. But none of you did that. Therefore, you're acknowledging I'm being truthful. And if I'm being truthful, then why aren't you listening? It's a very logical explanation. Verse 47, whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Powerful. These set of verses break the mold that Jesus is meek and mild and he was only just rainbows and unicorn and love and all of that. That's the picture that the world paints of Jesus. And here he is telling the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders of the day, you're of your father, the devil. You're the devil's kids. You're Damien. <laughs> That's what he's saying. There's no malice in Jesus's comments. He is heartbroken over this. He is heartbroken over the fact that these are men who claim to represent his father and they are misrepresenting him. So he is heartbroken and he's calling them out on it. And the desire is that they would repent. That's the Lord's heart for everyone to repent. So this is not some, you know, I'm going to zap you. This is calling them out for what it is. Jesus reserved harsh comments like this for only those who misrepresent the father. He didn't have words like this for the rich young ruler who said, oh, what do I got to do to be saved? Oh, I have too much. I can't. And he walked away. Jesus didn't say, you're of your father, the devil. He had compassion. Yeah, it's hard for a rich man to go to heaven. It's difficult. That's a good model for us. We are to hold one another accountable for how we represent the Lord. We should not be pointing out to unbelievers that they're acting as unbelievers do. And the Lord does say, who are we to judge unbelievers? But in the family, in the church, we're to judge, judge rightly. And certainly with love and exhortation and encouragement to realign our thinking and our words and our actions with what God's word says. If we claim to be Christians, we should be Christ-like. Certainly not perfectly because the process of sanctification continues on. But increasing frequency, that should be how we are. We should be calling one another out in love. And that happens virtually every Sunday here. We love one another. We care about one another. And when any of us say something or do something that doesn't line up with the word, we lovingly point out, well, what you just said or what you did doesn't quite line up with what the word says. With the expectation, the encouragement that we get into line. See, most places it's you have this filter. What am I going to say? What's the right answer here? What is expected of me as a Christian to say? That helps nobody. It helps no one because no one knows what's actually being thought. And if I have an improper thought and I filter it by what I think you expect me to say, then I'm never going to be corrected if it's wrong. I'm never going to be shown the truth of the word. I'm not going to be encouraged. It's just going to put that mask up. That's why it's so important that we feel comfortable and safe to share with what we're feeling and expressing, knowing that if we say something that's kind of out there, we lovingly say, hey, that's kind of out there. <laughs> and how do you reconcile that with the word? And it always goes back to the word, not any of our opinions. And we've seen that time and time again. We've seen such tremendous growth as disciples, long held beliefs that were just not quite right, slightly adjusted right on. And that's what we need to continue to do. So let's take a look at some characteristics of the devil or Satan because the Lord had a few things to say. Now, this is not going to be an exhaustive, systematic study of Satan. We'll just cover a few things that are covered by the verses that we're studying this morning. And the first one, though not directly addressed in these verses, I think is important to underscore because sometimes there's misconceptions. The first one in your notes, number one, he is a created being and does not possess godlike attributes. Many of us here are mature believers, and we understand that. But there are some who think that Satan is just the anti-God. He is equal to God in power and characteristics and capabilities, but he's not. He's just a created being. 
And so I want to point to you 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That he is prowling around proves that Satan is not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at one time. So he has to prowl around. He has to move around. And that goes true for the fallen angels called the demons do as well. They're prowling around. And so none of the attributes that we would attribute to the Lord God himself, like omnipresence, like omniscience, like omnipotence, those are attributes only of God. Satan and his enemy horde do not have that. So I just want to point that out. Number two, he is a murderer, was one from the beginning, and is not interested in converting anyone to his side. Hebrews 2, 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. That's a reference to the Lord having power over Satan. Going back to 1 Peter 5, 8, prowling around to devour. The enemy is not looking to gain somebody to his side and be part of his team and going to protect his team. He doesn't care about anything or anyone other than himself. So it's not like Star Wars movie with the dark side of the force and people being part of that team. That's a misconception. The enemy hates mankind because we are made in God's image. The Latin term for that is imago Dei, the image of God. He has no affinity for us. He doesn't care about us. He wants to see us destroyed. He wants to devour us. And if we happen to be in line with this program, that's just a happy coincidence. But he will destroy and kill. He doesn't care what we're doing, even if we're doing good things, as long as we're not doing what God's called us to do. Satan doesn't care what we do, even if we do good things, as long as we're not doing what the Lord's called us to do. Because he just wants us to be disobedient to God doesn't matter what we're doing. And we could be doing a good thing. If he hasn't called me to go feed the orphans, and I say, you know what, I'm going to do it, but the Lord hasn't called me to do that, the enemy's happy because I'm being disobedient to God. His sole purpose is just be disobedient to the Lord. Sometimes we talk about spiritual warfare and attack. It's legitimate. But sometimes what we think is a spiritual attack, we're just doing our own thing. And if we're doing our own thing, then the enemy doesn't have to butt in because if we're doing our own thing, he's like, go ahead, keep doing your own thing. So he's not interested in converting anyone to his side. He is a murderer and was a murderer from the beginning. Number three, there is no truth in him. He is not driven by truth, nor are his words limited to what is true. He doesn't limit his words. To engage with someone who lies, it's like trying to outspend a counterfeiter. Because they can just keep printing money. If you're going to use real money, guarantee every time that counterfeiter is going to outspend you because they're not limited by legitimate currency. A liar is not limited by the bounds of truth. Verse 44, when he lies. Underline that phrase, when he lies. Jesus didn't say when he speaks. He said when he lies. Very important distinction. It implies that Satan can say truthful things. Might want to think that Satan's always saying lies and everything he says is a lie. And if that was the case, then Jesus would say when he speaks. But he says when he lies. He can say truthful things, but it's always distorted, twisted, out of context, or a partial quote. Always. His motivation for using the truth is for deception, not to adhere to the truth. He's not a champion of truth. It's a convenient tool for him to use a partial verse out of context to manipulate and twist and distort. So this bold statement in your in your notes here, the most dangerous person you will encounter is one who lies. Absolutely the most dangerous. Why? Because not only will they lie to you, they will lie about you. And they're not bound by what is truthful. We've counseled many people, including her own children, when someone tells you they're a liar, believe them. Sounds weird, but when they tell you they're a liar, believe them. Because then who knows what they're going to say about you. They're going to take something out of context, deliberately, accidentally. No compunction about lying. Number four, he has nothing to do with the truth and does not stand in the truth. Now, depending on what translation you use, NASB will say he does not stand in the truth. The new ESV says he does not stand in truth. The older ESV from 2007 says he has nothing to do with the truth. 
I was using my Bible software, and I thought, uh-oh, is there an error here in my software? So I contacted the publisher of the software, and he's like, nope, it's all correct. And I opened up every Bible I had that was ESV translation, and it all said the same thing. And it turns out that beyond 2007, Crossway updated their ESV translation with a few adjustments, and that was one of the verses that were adjusted. So, like, okay. Now I need to get a new Bible. No. No. Just keep in mind that if you read that or if you heard me reading, you have a newer ESV, then that's why it's different. Just want to point that out. So he has nothing to do with the truth and does not stand in the truth. He may say something that is truthful, but the truth is not his mission. The truth is not his mission. That's not why he's telling the truth when he does. God will never use the enemy as his messenger of truth. Very important, especially in these days. How many times have we seen a brother or sister listening to either a poor teacher or a false teacher and their response is when you call them out on it, oh, well, I eat the meat and leave the bones. I have a couple of problems with that metaphor. Well, what if the person's a vegan? That's not going to help. But seriously, that false teacher, that poor teacher, any truth that they're sharing is not meat. It's usually baby formula. It's the milk. It's not eat the meat and leave the bones. It's more like drink the baby formula and leave the rat poison because the bones, it's like inert. Rat poison is active. You ingest rat poison, you die. Anyone who has a steady diet of false and poor teaching is ingesting rat poison. This is not something to fool around with. He has nothing to do with the truth. Number five, he is a liar and his character is that of a liar. That's who he is at his core. Who are we at our core? Are we marked by truth? Are we marked by humility? Are we marked by self-centeredness, arrogance, or pride? At our core, if someone were to use one word to describe us individually, what would that be? For the enemy, it's a liar. That's who he is at his core, a liar. Number six. He is the father of lies in that he was the first to lie and every lie spoken by anyone has its origins with him. Wow. Jesus said he's the father of lies. It's interesting that lying is the only sin in scripture that's been defined to have a father. That's noteworthy. All lying has its origin with Satan. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. The serpent said, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? That was a lie, worded as a question, but a lie. And he knew what God really said, but it was a lie. The first thing he said that's recorded in Scripture was a lie. That was the first lie recorded in the Bible right there. So we see the characteristics of Satan as a liar and what that means. So I think it's important for us as born-again believers who are children of the light to understand and focus on what it means to be truthful and the importance of being truthful, especially in this lost and dying world that doesn't place value on truth. So let's look at a few items here. Number one, being truthful is a fundamental element that demonstrates that a person who claims to be a Christian actually is one. Proverbs 12.22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Anyone who claims the name of Christ who does not champion truth in their speech. We must call them out on it. We must call them out on it. It's not helpful for them, and it's not helpful for the cause of Christ. Someone, an unbeliever, might think, ah, truth is no big deal to God. But that's not true. It's very important to God. Number two, truthfulness provides supporting evidence that our testimony of the gospel is true. Titus 2, 7 and 8. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. They may say something evil about us, but it's going to be because they made it up. If we are truthful, have sound speech. That's the intent. That's how the Lord has designed us to witness to the world. I know some of my brothers who love the fact that they are rejected by people they witness to. They take that as a badge of honor. Well, you see, I was bold and I shared the truth. 
And they rejected me and they called me all sorts of names. And I have to tell them, well, it's because you put a tract in their salad. <laughs> that actually happened. Well, of course, who is going to respond favorably to somebody putting a Bible tract in their salad? You know, we can't act that way. And then somebody is offended and then say, oh, look, I shared the truth. And they were offended. Jesus said that would happen. No, you offended them because you were a jerk. We are to be loving, we are to be kind, sharing the truth. We have to be truthful. It, it provides evidence. Don't get me wrong, please. The gospel is true no matter what we say. No matter what we do, it does not impact the truthfulness of God's word and the gospel at all. But having a reputation for truthfulness can certainly carry some weight in some situations to be able to share the truth, a door that could be opened. Truth is truth. God's truth does not depend on how we represent it, but we can be part of God's program when we represent it well. Number three, little white lies, stretching the truth, pastoral hyperbole, politically correct speech are not harmless. They are all sin. We might have some fancy terms for things, but all of those things are sin. They're lies, they're sin. I remember giving a sermon a couple years ago, and I used a personal anecdote. And in that anecdote, I explained how I was assembling a bed, had tons of words in the instructions. I didn't read any of the words. I just kind of fit the pieces together. And I had a couple of pieces left over. And in the middle of the night, the bed fell apart. <laughs> that was a true story. But Elizabeth, our daughter, asked Eva, Mama, did that really happen? And she said, of course it did. The reason why she asked was because she has friends whose dads were pastors who would often tell stories in their sermons that were kind of fabrications or stretching of the truth, that pastoral hyperbole. And it sounds like, oh, what's the harm? It's a funny story, but it caused her to think that I might be untruthful and share untruth because of what everyone else was doing. So it was pretty funny. Yeah, that really did happen. <laughs> was it funny in the middle of the night? No, it wasn't funny in the middle of the night. No, it wasn't. <laughs> No, so we got the Allen wrench out, and then I read the instructions, and I go, okay. And that was in contrast to Ikea instructions that have no words. And so whenever we get something from Ikea, my first exclamation is, would it kill them to put a few words in there? <laughs> but then when they had instructions that had words, I didn't read them. So we have to be careful about that. We consider telling a white lie. We think, well, it's usually to avoid an unpleasant situation either creating one or falling into one. But consider that maybe the Lord wants to use you in that uncomfortable situation. Pain avoidance. I'm all about avoiding pain. But I have to be limited by truthfulness. I have to be limited by what God's Word says. So I try to avoid pain whenever possible. I'm not a glutton for punishment. And maybe I'll see somebody and I'm like, if I run into them, I'm going to have to say something that I needed to say to them. Well, maybe let me go around this aisle here. And if, if I turn the corner and they're there, all right. And sometimes no. I'm like, okay. But if I try to avoid the situation beyond that, the Lord says, no, no, I want you to do this. And so even though I'm kind of like, bam, I turn the corner, that are right there. Hey, how you doing? Oh, by the way, we have to have a talk. Don't be afraid that you're going to miss an opportunity for a difficult situation because if the Lord wants you in that difficult situation, he's going to make it happen. I'm not encouraging you to go looking for these unpleasant situations. The Lord wants you to be part of that because he has work for you or work in you. It'll happen. Ephesians 4.29, very important. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Wow. Is that so appropriate in this political season or what? But only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That's why I underline the, the phrase, as fits the occasion. If you can't say something edifying, then don't say anything. There's no requirement for us to speak a positive comment in every situation. Sometimes when people are hurting, people are hurting. And to say, oh, it'll all work out. It's all good. When someone is just received a result from a test that they have cancer, say, oh, it's all good. That's nonsense. As fits the occasion, we have to be considerate and concerning. What's the occasion? Can I say something that is edifying in this situation? Sometimes what's edifying is, I don't even know how to respond. Can I pray with you? Because I don't understand this either. Platitudes are not helpful. Oftentimes, platitudes are not true. It's more important for us to be obedient to God's word 
than to have that Pollyanna response to every situation. God has not called us to do that. I'd like to read to you from Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Out of those seven things that are an abomination to the Lord, three of them have to do with lying. This is no little thing. And before we continue on the fourth and fifth point, I'm going to read something to you because it's very relevant. It's from and about Muslim scholars, what the Muslims believe. In Islam, Tariya is described as hiding, concealment, dissemblance, dissimulation, hypocrisy, equivocation, ambiguity, double entendre, illusion. As a doctrine, double entendre best describes Tariya's function. According to past and present Muslim scholars, Tariya occurs when a speaker says something that means one thing to the listener, although the speaker means something else, and his words technically support this alternate meaning. For example, if someone declares, I do not have a penny in my pocket, most listeners will assume the speaker has no money on him, although he might have dollar bills, just literally no pennies. This ruse is considered legitimate according to Sharia law. It does not constitute lying, which in Islam is otherwise forbidden except in three cases. Lying in war, lying to one's spouse, and lying in order to reconcile people. For these exceptions, Sharia permits Muslims to lie freely without the strictures of Taria, that is, without the need to be creative. After just what we've read Jesus himself say to the Pharisees about them being of their father, and Satan is the father of lies, and here's a worldview, a religion that endorses and embraces lying, what's the logical conclusion? It's impossible to believe that the God of Islam is the same God of the scriptures. It's impossible. God is truth, and here the God of Islam is saying, it's okay to lie. Incompatible. But I wanted to share that with you because it's so fitting in what's going on in the world and how there's this real push to embrace everybody. Oh, we worship the same God, just different ways. Different God. If they are lying, who is their father? I'm not saying that. You're not saying that. Jesus said it because Satan is the father of lies. It's getting tougher and tougher. But by God's grace and the power of his Holy Spirit that's in each and every one of us, we will stand firm on the word in love and in truth. That's why he has brought us here at such a time as this, in this stage of all of history, because he has equipped us for this. Number four, because God is truth, believers should have speech that is clear and direct, free from innuendo, speculation, and parsing. That's in contrast to what we just heard about Muslims and Sharia law. Matthew 5.37, Jesus said, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Direct, doesn't have to be harsh, doesn't have to be uncaring, but direct and clear. A while ago, I, I did an experiment to show people the importance of having clear and direct speech, that sometimes too little information can be just as dangerous as too much information. I'd walk into the office, and I was limping a little bit, and they'd say, Tom, how come you're limping? And I would say, there was a basketball, a pencil, and I'd rather not talk about it. Now, I just made up those two things, basketball and pencil, but their minds immediately tried to connect. Limp, basketball, pencil. What situation could have happened that, involving a pencil and a basketball that resulted in him limping? So I did that a couple of times. I said, do you see how dangerous it is not to provide enough information? The mind connects dots. And we might withhold information because we think we're protecting somebody's privacy, when in reality, we've opened the door to speculation, which is worse than telling what actually happened. Then it becomes a reflection of the person's own mind who heard it, rather than what the truth of the situation is. No, it had nothing to do with a basketball or pencil. I'm not limping, so. But that's how we are wired, to connect dots. So we have to be clear in our communication, to provide enough information to guide the hearer to the truth, 
not to leave it open to speculation and wonder, oh, I wonder what he meant by that. And you've heard some of those vague prayers. What's the term? Vague booking? Yeah. Vague booking. You go on Facebook and somebody says some weird comment that's out of context. You're like, what was that about? You know there's a backstory and you're left wondering, what did they... We have to be clear in our communication to help people be on the path of truth. And we'll leave with number five. Truth must always be accompanied by or motivated by love. Love for the Lord, love for the person, love for observers who may be in attendance of where truth needs to be spoken. 1 Corinthians 13.2 And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. The importance of fellowship is to demonstrate love for one another before we need to share truth. That makes it so much easier. I'm reminded of a mentor of mine early in my ministry. Some of you may know him, Pastor Al James. He told us young, young, I wasn't young at the time. I was always old. But (laughs) he told us at the time during these mentoring sessions, love God's people. First and foremost, love God's people. If his people know that you genuinely, sincerely love them and care for them, when you tell them the truth, they know it comes from a heart of love. And that's what I try to do. Don't do it perfectly, but I have seen time and time again when we've loved people in a way that's genuine and sincere, and then the Lord brings up the situation to us with this person or couple, and we share a difficult truth with them. Because we have demonstrated absolute love with no agenda, this is what God's Word says. We just want God's best for you. We've had the privilege of seeing them receive the truth, make that correction, and just blossom and grow. And we rejoice with them. I would encourage you all, to be loving first, the truth and love. But sometimes the love comes first. Sometimes we need to be loving first before we have the opportunity to speak truth. Because it's, it's easy. It's, you know, just open up scripture, point to say, hey, you, this is what the truth says. Oh, by the way, I love you. That's not going to work. It's got to be genuine and sincere. No ulterior motive like, oh, she's really off the rails. So I'm going to show her that I love her so that then I can share the truth with her. No, it doesn't work that way. We just genuinely and sincerely love our brothers and sisters. And sometimes they'll speak the truth into our lives. And sometimes we'll speak the truth into their lives. But it's all motivated and demonstrated by a history of love. That's it. And this final thought, since every word that is spoken begins with an unspoken thought, truthful speech requires taking every thought captive to obey Christ. It's so difficult And early on as a believer, I was just controlling my speech, not too much with the thoughts, but with the speech. And it was so difficult. I had to like really think about what I was going to say before I said it because my mind wasn't thinking the right way. But as I spent time in prayer and time with the Lord and taking every thought captive, not just captive, but to obey Christ. So if I had a thought that did not line up with his word, not line up with his truth, How do I change that thought so it does? If my thoughts are more closely aligned with God's truth, then I have to do less thinking when I speak. Because what's going to come out, from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It makes it so much easier to work on the mind and work on the heart. And then what flows out is more truthful than trying to hold back. That's not how the Lord wants us to live. And we should have that free flow that comes out of our heart of love, truth, When we are right with the Lord in private, it comes out in our speech and our interaction with others. Please agree with me in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are the Father of lights and every perfect and every wonderful good gift comes from you in contrast to the Father of lies that prowls around looking and seeking who he can devour. Lord, we thank you that we are children of the light and your Holy Spirit in us convicts us and encourages us and empowers us to be truthful, to be messengers of truth. And because of your great love for us, we are not just equipped with the truth, but we are equipped with your love as well. Lord, uh, we should be the most loving people on this planet because we have been loved perfectly by you. And so, Lord, we do ask for opportunities to share the love of Christ and the truth of Christ with any and all that we come in contact with, that we would represent you well, that 
Time spent with us would draw people closer to you, not further away. And we desire to be obedient to those opportunities to bring you glory and honor, and that would be a blessing to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.